Okay, everybody. I want to welcome you all to our monthly Brown Bag presentation. This month, we're featuring Sean Turner with Texas Transportation Institute. He's here to talk to a bunch of what I'm guessing are bike pet enthusiasts about hiking, biking data, and international trends. Um, I wanted to let you all know our November and December programs, we're going to be on hiatus for the holidays, but we will be back in January with Brent Lacey with AECOM presenting on smart transportation. And as always, if anyone is interested in presenting or knows someone has a suggestion that they might want to see for a presentation, please let me know. My card is on the table or you can just catch me afterwards. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Sean. Howdy. Come on, we do better than that up in College Station. Howdy. All right. Um, so I, I'm going to just sort of do this informally, even though I understand I'm on camera and whatnot. Uh, I want to talk about data. Uh, one of the things that's actually two of the things that's near and dear to my heart, uh, biking and walking uh, and data. And so I've been fortunate to um, do a little bit of traveling and looked at what some other folks are doing as well as to do some research uh, here in Texas and in the US. I just wanted to share a little bit of my experience, some of the things that, that we've done. One of the things that we're um, just starting here, we're starting, TTI is starting a project with HGAC to look at essentially establishing a regular monitoring program for biking and walking in the Houston Galveston region. So we're going to be getting underway with that um, in the next month or so. And hopefully some of the slides, some of the example slides that I show from Portland, we can just plug in some Houston data in a couple of years and be able to show similar kinds of progress. Um, in terms of what I wanted to talk about today, again, it's, it's informal. If you all have questions, just, um, just feel free to interrupt or raise your hand or whatever. I um, want to talk about why data is important, talk about what data do we need to make different types of decisions, and then talk a little bit about some of the different activities that are going on both uh, nationally and a little bit of international. Why is biking and walking data important? Uh, you know, I, I think it's pretty much important for the same reason that we have data for a lot of the other modes. Um, we need to make better decisions. We need to make informed decisions. And so whether those decisions are trying to support the policy decisions or changes to existing policies, whether it's trying to make more cost-effective um, investments in our infrastructure, whether it's focused on design attributes or design elements. Um, and I think most importantly um, is measuring the performance and progress towards our goals. You know, as, as planners, we set out these goals and I think we need to periodically assess and see where we are in, in terms of meeting these goals. Um, I, I, I know one of the things that I've heard a fair bit about, and I don't know how big it is here in the region, um, but for some reason, e even though bicycle and pedestrian funding is a very small slice of the funding pie, that seems to get questioned a lot more than other things. I mean, it, I guess in some ways it's an easy target. And, I, and so I think being able to point to how we're making progress in, in that particular area is important if we want to be able to maintain that funding. Um, there's a couple of there's a couple of phrases that, that are fairly common in terms of uh, performance monitoring. What gets measured gets done. One of the other things you may have heard is if you're not counted, you don't count. Um, and so that's why, that's why it's important to have data. You know, in, in a lot of cases, um, we, we are making decisions when we look at biking and walking facilities with, with very little um, quantitative data. <clears throat> One of the examples that that I like to point to and a lot of other people also like to point to just because they've made a lot of progress in the past 20 years is Portland and so the next couple of slides I'm going to be showing you examples um, from Portland where they have collected data and, and it hasn't been a lot of data but it's been enough data to, to more or less prove the point that funding infrastructure providing bicycling facilities makes a difference in terms of 
usage as well as in terms of safety. So let me just walk through um, a couple of these charts. What the city of Portland has done is they have, since about 1991, they have tracked the number of cyclists coming across the four bridges into downtown Portland. If you're familiar at all with downtown Portland, it's got the river on the east side of downtown, and so there are four major bridge crossings into downtown, and so they've tracked the, uh, the bicycle traffic on those four crossings for about the past 18 or 19 years. At the same time, they have had, um, they have had quite a bit of investment um, and they have been able to add a number of lane miles. And so these red bars you see are the number of uh, bikeway mileage essentially that they've had within the, within the Portland region. And so you can see in 1992 they started with about 83 miles of bikeways and the, uh, 83 is corresponding to this axis over here. And across those four bridges they had about, about 3,000 daily trips. 16, 17 years later in 2008, um, they've been able to about triple if not quadruple the number of bikeway, uh, bikeway mileage, but the number of daily trips has increased by a much larger factor. In this case, I think it's about seven or eight times. And so you can see with something like this sort of makes the point, build it and they will come. And that's, that has been the experience in Portland. One of the things that you might say is, well, they're only looking at those counts on those particular bridges. That's, you know, that's maybe over-representing what's happening citywide. Well, what they've done is, as, as they've put more emphasis on their bicycling program, they've come back and in the past couple of years, they're now monitoring and they're doing these short-term monitoring. So they're going out and doing, say, a 24-hour or, or a a, a multi-day count, but they're doing these short-term counts at 43 locations citywide, and what they've been able to demonstrate is that pretty much the traffic that they've been counting for 20 years on those four bridges tracks pretty cr closely with these 43 other locations that are citywide, which sort of supports this notion that what's happening at sort of these main, main, these main four bridges indicators, those are good indicators for what's going on in the rest of the city. Um, and so that helps, again, this, this data helps to support, probably y'all have heard about this notion of safety in numbers. You know, one of the things that, that um, the, the bicycling profession talks about is wanting to get more people cycling. The more people that's present on the street network, the more the, that, they, that bicyclists and pedestrians are a part of the everyday mix in street traffic, the more visible they will be. Um, the more comfortable cyclists and pedestrians will be because they're not out there all by themselves. And so that's essentially what this demonstrates. So let me just point out one or two things here real quick. Again, this is the, this is the bridge traffic on those four bridges that they've tracked over the past 17 years. They've also tracked the number of bicycle crashes within the city of Portland, and these are these red dots. And so what you can see is that as the traffic has increased by almost a factor of six or seven, the number of crashes have stayed pretty stable. Well, you might look at that and say, well, you know, the, the crashes aren't coming down, but in reality, you know, we do this a lot when we talk about motor vehicle crash analysis. You've got to normalize it by the exposure. And so whenever you normalize their crashes by the exposure, what you can see is that really their, their crash rate, this, this trend line represents their crash rate, and so they've been able to significantly reduce their crash rate over the past 15 or so years uh, based on their program. So again, without this, kind of, without this kind of data, without this kind of information, it's very difficult to make this point. And so I've used it in a lot of my presentations, a lot of other people are using it in presentations. Um, but it would be really nice if we could have that same kind of information in Houston and Austin and a lot of other cities here in Texas. We're starting to do that. I'm going to mention um, one or two other uh, programs that have recently been initiated, and I'm looking forward to working with HJC on getting something started here in um, the Houston Galveston area. So, in terms of what kind of data do we need, um, it, it's it's, it's always important, you know, I, I, I'm a data wonk, and, I, and so I like to think about data. 
But I'm going to throw out a caution and say, you've got to focus on your users and your uses. What, what kind of decisions do you want to make and who needs that information? And that's going to help you figure out, well, exactly what. Because the next slide I'm going to show you has a lot of different information, a lot of different types of data that you can collect. But again, I think the important thing is to focus on what decisions do you need to make, um, who is going to be making those decisions, and, and, um, and, and use that to sort of frame your, your uh, data collection program. So there was a pretty good study that was done by the Bureau of Transportation Statistics that sort of outlined the state of the practice in biking and walking data. Um, it's a little bit dated by now, but it's pretty good. What it talks about, and I would almost say these are sort of in the order of importance, more or less. So what they talk about is they talk about facilities data, inventory, knowing where you've got sidewalks, knowing where you have um, sidewalks that meet accessibility requirements, knowing what the quality of those sidewalks or that bikeway network is. And that, that's essentially the, the, the underlying um, information that will serve a lot of other analyses. Probably the next important thing is, well, now you've, you've got maybe parts of a network. Well, how, how many people are out there using it? What are they using it for? Where are they going to or from? So having some of that information about how the, the network is being used, what kind of trips are being made. Obviously, we want to know about crash, and we want to be able to, to have safety information to make sure that we're building safe facilities that we're providing that we're safely accommodating cyclists and pedestrians. Um, we want to know what type of facilities um, people prefer. You know, one, I think one of the strategies, and this has been a common strategy for the past 10 or more years, is on, on busy roads, on busy streets, um, we have tried uh, we've taken sort of a minimalist approach we've done for bicyclists. We've, we've put in maybe wide curb lanes, we've put in bike lanes, but what we're finding and what we're finding from a few of these cities like Portland and Seattle and New York is that quite honestly 98% of the population isn't going to go out and ride in a wide curb lane or a shared, a shared lane. They want something that they prefer a little bit more separation. So we need to understand what some of those user preferences are such that we can make sure that we're accommodating and that we're building for all different types of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, all different types of cyclists. And as a researcher, we've got to throw this in here. We want to have research and evaluation data, not just for research purposes, but again, one of those things that I talked about before was that performance monitoring, wanting to complete that feedback loop. So we've got to be able to have that evaluation information to make sure that what we're doing uh, is the right thing and is the most effective thing. Whenever we talk about biking and walking data, um, there, there sure is a lot of challenges. I don't, I don't want to dwell too much on the challenges, I wanna just, but I want to just mention some of those. Um, one of the things that, I'm originally from Pennsylvania and I, I went to school at Penn State, so I got to mention a quote from Tom Larson who was uh, a DOT person and, and uh, spent some time at Penn State. Um, he, he sort of said uh, 20 or more years ago that, that biking and walking were essentially the forgotten modes. I think given the current transportation planning and environment, I don't think they're being forgotten as often as they were. I think uh, biking and walking is being mentioned a lot more and more. But typically, I mean, even given that though, there, typically, it's a lower priority. There's fewer resources for um, for these modes. Um, typically, smaller numbers. Typically, higher variability. Um, it, you know, it, I know in Houston, a lot of the Texas, a lot of the Southwest cities, the number of people that you're going to get biking and walking is going to vary a lot based on the weather um, and, and based on the the season that you're in. <laughs> DOTs and transportation agencies typically do a really good job of collecting on major highways where there is a lot of car traffic and where there's a lot of truck traffic. Unfortunately, or fortunately, that's not where a lot of cyclists and pedestrians are. People that are biking and walking prefer 
lower volume streets, lower speed streets. And so what you're typically going to find is you're going to find more people biking and walking on city streets where we, where we typically tend to put less resources um, for counting for car and, and vehicle traffic. And so there's sort of less of an opportunity for that overlap. Um, one of the things also, one of the other challenges is that quite honestly, it's, it's difficult to automatically count and to, to, to count and measure people that are biking and walking. Um, we've, been, we've been practicing and we've been doing it for 40 and 50 years for cars and trucks and we've, we've made a lot of progress in that 40 or 50 years. The, 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 really, the standard practice across a lot of the cities is to go out and, and send a student or send an intern out there for a couple of hours and count it and say that's your average for that particular period. Um, there are, however, and I'm going to mention a few of those, there are, however, some, um, some types of automated equipment that can be used and, and that are being refined that helps um, on this particular point. Um, one of the other challenges is, is the scale of facilities. Um, with, with cars and trucks, we pretty much know, okay, these are, the, these are the 12 foot lanes, these are the 11 foot lanes that the cars and the trucks are going to be in and, and they have, uh, e even though they, there are a number of dirt ramps around the Houston area from the freeway to the frontage road, they are generally going to stay in a fixed lane position. Um, that's not quite the same with bicyclists and pedestrians. You know, bicyclists can ride the wrong way, they ride on sidewalks. Um, same thing with pedestrians. They're not necessarily confined to a, a given zone in a lot of cases. And so there's challenges, plus there's a whole lot more. I mean, think about trying to capture the, the pedestrian movements in a downtown area. H how are you, I mean, you're obviously gonna have to focus on one, a few spots but do those spots really represent everything that's going on in a much wider area? I'm going to take a quick poll. I've got, so I can veer off two different ways here. I can talk about some practical stuff about equipment, or I can talk about some, I think, some really cool stuff that's happening in the mobile devices. It's more sort of, I don't know, it's, it's, kind of, it's not pie in the sky. I think it's something that's going to happen uh, five or so years from now. So are y'all, who wants practical? Who wants, to, who wants I've, I've got some slides in here that talks about automated equipment. And then who wants, who wants more longer term future trends? All right, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do the automated counters. I'll, I'll fly through the other slides. In the past couple of years, um, TTI has been involved in a number of different activities where we've tried to evaluate the types of equipment that's available such that we don't have to send students or interns out for two hours at a time. We can essentially put in either permanent equipment or we can put in some short-term temporary equipment. Um, and so these are examples of some of those. Again, the, the, the technology to do this on the car and the truck side, we've been at this for 40 or 50 years. Inductance loop detectors, uh, some of the other um, side fire radars are a little bit more recent, but we've sort of had the chance to perfect some of this over the past 10 or 15 years. That's not quite been the case. There hasn't necessarily been as much market demand for counting bicyclists and pedestrians. From the little bit of time that I've been involved in this, I am seeing a little bit more demand, and so I'm seeing some, some improvements in some of the different types of products. Um, but in some cases, what's happening is that some of the car counters are just sort of getting their labels changed and they're calling it a bike counter. For example, this was a, this was a counter that was um, labeled as a bike, bicycle and pedestrian counter. Suspiciously, it looks a lot like that company's vehicle counter. What we found whenever we put it out on a trail and we tested it was that they hadn't quite fine-tuned the parameters and so this did, this did great with counting pedestrians that were walking by, but if you got a cyclist that was going, say, more than 15 miles per hour, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't pick them up. And so what you have to be careful is you just have to um, be careful with this, some of these types of automated equipment. One of the other things that we have seen uh, quite commonly with a lot of these different um, 
bicyclists and pedestrian counters is um, if, if people are walking or riding in groups, what happens is in, in several of these, these equipment, this is an, uh, an infrared and this is an infrared sensor as well. And what these infrared sensors do is they essentially, they sense the heat differences that are out in front of them in that detection zone. Right, and so what happens is you get, if you're on a busy trail and you get people that are say jogging or walking side by side or maybe they're bicycling close to each other, um, what happens is to, this, to some of this equipment that's not really uh, developed as much as it should be, essentially just sees them as one. And so I think it's here on one of these, these next slides. These are some other examples of just different types of trail counters. Um, these are these are all infrared. Um, they they can be the the most common practice is to put these in like a post or there's different types of boxes. Obviously, you want to make them vandal proof um, and somewhat inconspicuous if you're going to put them along a trail. Um, but you can you can uh, set these up. They can be set up either either portable or in a more of a permanent situation. The, this. This uh, counter in particular is more of a, a longer term that, that is, I guess it's a little bit more field hardened than some of the others. But one of the things that we found with this infrared counting equipment, and we did a, quite a number of tests with it, is that because of this group phenomena, if, again, if you've got people that are walking and bicycling in close proximity to the other, what you're going to end up with is that these groups, you've got groups of two or three they're only going to be counted as one. And so what we saw on quite a number of these um, devices that we tested at least several years ago was we saw that they would typically undercount the number. Um, and so that's one thing that you want to be careful about. Um, one of the things that TTI has done is we've worked with some of these vendors and we've given them the feedback and said, here's, here's the issue. Um, in response, there's been one or two of them that have actually fine-tuned their equipment. They've, they've, um, they've changed or they've given the ability to modify the sensitivity so that, so that a few of the, uh, the models are now more, uh, they're essentially more sensitive to, to differentiating pedestrians and cyclists in groups. Um, this is something that I wanted to mention. This was a project that we finished up a little bit ago in Austin. Um, it's it's going to be pretty much, it's similar to what we're going to be doing in, in the Houston Galveston area. We did a state of the practice review. We, we talked to other cities and regions about how they were monitoring bicyclists, pedestrians. What we ended up doing in Austin was we, we recommended this program that it, it pretty much follows the traditional traffic monitoring principles in that you, you, you're obviously going to have to sample and so you, you, what we recommended was we recommended two locations that were permanent long-term, uh, essentially they were permanent continuous counters. What that does is that gives you um, continuous uh, time of day as well as uh, season of the year trends. And then whenever you go the, and do these other short-term counts, again, just like TxDOT has been doing for 30 or 40 years, you can then adjust those short-term counts, whether they were taken in May or November or whether you know, they were taken in June. You can adjust those and annualize those according to these continuous 365-day-a-year um, counts. And so that's what we, that's what we developed for um, Campo, they've been collecting data f off those permanent counters for about nine months. Um, it was interesting, not at this particular location. There's a famous cyclist that lives in Austin. Does anybody know his name? <laughs> um, it, so it wasn't at this location, but it was at our other permanent location. Said famous cyclist just happened to be one of the first cyclists that was over our permanent counters. We had put one of one of the permanent counters was on the Lance Armstrong bikeway, and so we, they were out there basically setting up the equipment, and someone saw these huge calves and said, that guy looks familiar. And so there he went. Um, just real quick, this is, this is some of the, uh, this, these are some of the opportunities that I think are going to be coming along in the next couple of years and maybe the next five or so years. 
One of the things that's nice about um, the, the bicycling and, and pedestrian community is, at least from what I've seen, there's a lot of passion um, in, in the, the, that group. And so what's happened in the past five or so years is that there's been several grassroots efforts from within the community to try and pretty much to, to try and raise the bar. You know, one of those efforts has been this initiative that maybe y'all, some of y'all have heard about that. It's this National Bicycle Pedestrian Documentation Project. Essentially, this one consulting firm, Alta, teamed with ITE and they said, hey, you know, a lot of cities are already collecting this data. Let's try and pull all this stuff together and let's try and make some sort of a national database. So that's, that's w one of the things that they started. There's another group um, it used to be called, it, it's really a national coalition of advocacy organizations. It used to be called the Thunderhead Alliance. It's now called the Alliance for Bicycling and Walking. They started this effort called the Benchmarking Project about four or five years ago. What, what it is, it, it, it's awesome. And if you haven't seen it, you need to check it out if you're interested in national level statistics. I would say that this is probably the best encyclopedia of, of uh, bicycling and walking data because they're taking data from all, excuse me, they're taking data from all different sources and bringing it together in one place and making state to state comparisons as well as city to city comparisons. So if you're into peer comparisons, this is a really good, really comprehensive report. Um, again, this was, this started out as a small grassroots effort. This now has um, CDC Centers for Disease Control, some pretty substantial funding, so they've been able to come a long way with that. One of the other opportunities that I see, you know, it, it is with the private sector and with mapping and navigation industry. Um, I'm, I, and so in that respect, I'm somewhat of a capitalist in that I think that these companies can collect data and there's a market for their data and that they can collect it in some cases more effectively or cost efficiently than the public sector. And just a couple of examples is um, just within the past, I guess maybe it's been up there about two years, Google has added um, the bicycle routing to their map. And so if you've used it, you've probably noticed that it's not perfect, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, and I think, I think you're going to see similar types of improvements when we talk about um, pedestrian navigation. Again, one of the things that, that everybody in this room probably is carrying around except for me since I got, I, it got wet over the weekend and it's now not working. Everybody's got a, a, a smartphone or a mobile device, right, that we're carrying around. Um, there's, go, there's increasingly a lot more location services um, and there's going to be companies that are going to be supporting these location services. One of those companies is Navtech. Um, it's one of the world's largest map makers. And so they've got this thing called Discover Cities where it's essentially a pedestrian guide. Um, so this is just one example. I'm sure if you go out to the App Store, you can see lots of other examples of different types of inexpensive apps where people are either gathering data or they have some sort of a database. It could be crowdsourced. It could be something that they've developed on their own. But it's for people that are out walking around and want to be able to um, want to be able to find their way as they're walking and not necessarily driving. I know one of the things I don't know if y'all have seen this is in some, and I don't know if it's on the Android or if it's on the iPhone yet or not, but you can essentially it's almost like a, a live street view where you hold it up you, you can hold up your smartphone and it'll look through with using its camera it'll compare the buildings that you're looking at and try and figure out from the building outlines where you are. I think we're going to see more and more features like that through, through the private sector. And with that, I think there's opportunities to gather information as well. Um, this is another example. Um, this is WalkScore. Have any, has anybody checked out WalkScore? If you haven't, it's pretty cool. And it, they literally just took another database of businesses. It was, it's directory information, mapping and directory information, and they looked at um, how close that information, or how, how close these basic essential day-to-day -day services are um, and, and develop this walk score. Certainly you can do, um, you can refine that a lot, but I think it has really, um, really changed the emphasis and has really sort of opened people's eyes to the point where I think this is now in a couple of real estate 
websites. I think Zillow uses Walk Score, has that as part of their real estate listings. So everybody's got mobile devices, everybody's checking in, you've got these location aware things. Um, you've got the ability to track if you're, you know, if you're doing something recreational, you've got the ability to track that, you've got the ability to post that through a different bunch of different kinds of social media. Um, there are some privacy concerns. I, I think this, this uh, the younger generation, I, I think uh, maybe they don't have as much privacy concerns as some of the older generations. Um, certainly you need to be careful whenever you're collecting data um, f from mobile devices. We're doing uh, a, um, a project in the Austin region that's similar to one that they started out in San Francisco and I think they've done it now, they've repeated it in several other cities where we're essentially um, allowing cyclists to put in to track their trips on a routine basis and then what you end up with is you end up with a with an idea of where where um, do people prefer riding or where are they riding the most and it's just this is uh, the the essence of crowdsourced data it's not perfect I mean in some respects it's sort of a it's it's a biased because you're only getting the people that have the smartphones and whatnot but again it's it's certainly better than having no information um, there's there's a lot of different activities going on in the, at the national level. Um, I, I'm, I've just put a few of them up here. I think I've already mentioned a few of those. Um, if you're if you're like me and you're interested in biking and walking and you like data, um, this is an exciting time to be in this profession because there really is. I mean, there's a lot of different activity going on. I've mentioned the documentation project. Um, Right now, I, I think that's still pretty much a grassroots effort. I think there's some movement underway with these NCHRP projects to try and institutionalize that, either as a, as a national database within Federal Highway Administration or some other federal agency. Um, for the first time, there's this traffic monitoring guide that Federal Highway publishes, um, and they've published that probably, I think the first guide was the 70s and so for the first time uh, they're going to have um, some information on there about monitoring bicyclists and pedestrians. I'm going to help write that so I'm excited to be a part of that. Um, so there, anyway there's a lot of different activity out there. Um, if you want some more information on any of this just you can google some of the keywords there or just check in with me later. I was I was fortunate to be a part of an international scan tour a couple of years ago um, and so we went to it was a scan tour on pedestrian and bicyclist safety and so me and 11 other I think it was about 11 or 12 other people from DOTs and a couple MPOs went to what was it, it was 10 different cities and five countries in Western Europe and we just saw some amazing things in terms of biking and walking one of the things that was interesting that we saw in relation to monitoring and in relation to data um, were these what they call bike barometers. It's essentially just a bike counter that they've put in a pretty visible location. For instance, this is in a, a pedestrian mall area where there's a path that, that cuts through the pedestrian mall. This was on, this is in Copenhagen and this is actually a, one of their major arterials but it's right to the side of their public square so it's got a lot of visibility. Um, I predict that we're going to see something like this in the U.S. I don't know. Has anybody seen anything like this in the U.S. yet? I know that I know they've talked about putting it in several locations. I know there's one or two vendors that I've talked with that are that that are trying to sort of piece together or source out the the um, the parts to be able to do this. But what this does, I mean, if you look at this number, if you look at these numbers, this essentially it. it makes people pause and say, wow, I guess a lot of people really do walk or bike. This is the number of people that were, that have biked just this day. So in this, through this particular square, this was in, uh, well, this was in, I think it was, oh, this was Lund, Sweden. And so about 4,000 people had come through there on bikes, and this was about noon time. So their, their average daily traffic probably would have been about eight or 10,000. 
Um, so this tracks their daily, this tracks their year to date. Uh, we were there in May. I, I'm not, I can't read these numbers, but it, th these were, I know these were, I think, in the hundred thousands. This particular counter in Copenhagen, um, again, I think this was mid-morning. It had about 1,300. It had the number of cyclists that, that year, and that was already up to about 57,000. Um, so it These um, are have, these in particular are using something that's a little more accurate than what the infrared sensors that I've talked about earlier. So these actually have, I, I believe, the one in Sweden had inductance loop detectors. The one in Copenhagen had it was either a combination of inductance loops or some type of piezo, or was a special it was a special configuration of a loop detector. Um, and that's something that really uh, a number of cities in the U.S. have started to use when they want to do bicycle-specific counts. It's really probably the most accurate long-term or the most accurate permanent counting method for bicyclists is, is loop detectors, but you've got to do a special configuration for the bicycles, um, a special configuration that's different than that for motor vehicles. Um, and, and again, just what I think this was, yeah, this was the something that was on my title slide. Um, this was one of the other busy avenues in Copenhagen. It was just amazing to see how many people were cycling in these in these cycle tracks. And in this case, it was so busy that the cycle tracks had actually been doubled. So the the cycle track here is actually the width of two about. I don't know what it was in meters, but it's about the, the width of a vehicle lane, 10 or 12 feet. Um, and they routinely, I think this is one of the busiest streets in terms of bike traffic in Copenhagen, and, and so they routinely get about 36,000 bikes on, um, on this particular street, on this location, um, on any given day. Whoops, my animation's off a little bit. <laughs> So I guess to, to sum up, um, I did mention a few of the challenges. You know, I, I think those challenges will remain. I think one of the things that I, that, that I say a lot when I talk about data is don't let the perfect be the enemy of good. We can't wait until we have perfect data. We have to take the best that we have right now and keep continuing to make improvements. And I think we're seeing improvements being made um, in terms of the equipment, in terms of uh, more cities and more state DOTs um, incorporating at least bicycling, uh, if not walking into their monitoring programs, as well as travel surveys. Um, the, in, in the most recent go-round of the National Household Travel Survey, there were several states and regions that did um, add-on surveys, essentially paid to collect additional travel survey information on specific issues related to biking and walking um, and safe routes to school. Uh, again, my, my main point is focusing on the uses and users. Who's going to who's going to be using that information? What decisions are they are they going to be making? Um, capture the passion and the dedication of the advocates. One of the things that I didn't mention is that in, in a number of cities, they're actually getting volunteers from advocacy groups to do some of these counting. So it's not just students and interns, but it's actually you know club members or it's advocates that are out there doing the counting. Um, the, the other thing that I think is on our horizon is this whole notion of mobile devices and essentially carrying around this, this very small computer that's got amazing data collection capability and having that in a large percentage of, uh, of people's pockets offers a lot of potential, um, but because of privacy, I think we have to be careful about how we use that potential. So with that, I hope you all have lots of questions or discussion. and. I have a question. Uh, one, well, actually, real three quick ones. One, Sean, could you share your uh, PowerPoint slideshow, even in hard copy, with us? You bet. Nope, sure. Uh, two, I'll let you know the city of Houston, right now we're doing ATR counts on a couple of our trails, and we've been doing them for three years, certain time periods, just to see the rate of growth over time, kind of with manual counts mm -hmm. in two hour peak periods, just to try to see how we could capture that or mm -hmm. what data aren't we capturing through the use of tubes 
And then uh, three, we just look forward to working with you and yeah. Jeff Table and the HAC here on uh, some maybe some perfect applications for the region. Sounds Thank great. You. So y'all already have several yeah, inductance data. boot detectors. So far, okay. it, it started with um, years ago with uh, just the national effort yeah. and manual accounts, but um, we've somehow lost any advocate interest in, in supplementing the effort. However, uh, we've been able to continue it as a city effort with a few okay. volunteers to be able to just kind of see where we're going and we're doing it along uh, one of the bio systems where we're investing heavily mm -hmm. with connections to downtown. So before it opens into downtown, we see yeah. what the volumes are and then afterwards we're anticipating a, a large row. Yep. No, I we'll we'll definitely be in touch, Dan, about and that again, that continuous data is extremely valuable. And I think that can inform some of the decisions that we're gonna be making in this um, in, in selecting and designing that sh those short-term counts. Um, I just want to let you guys know, we will uh, have the complete presentation with the audio posted online within a day or two, so that will be available on our website. Yeah, Terry. With funds being so limited at this time, is there any possibility that TTI could sponsor some the installation of some of these in our key city so that we could do comparisons? I would I would love to be able to do it. Um, we don't necessarily, TTI is a, uh, as a state agency, we have, we're really based on contract research and so we are there to help agencies. One of the things that I will offer though is we have, um, we have purchased through some of these research projects that I mentioned, we have several of these portable counting devices where we're willing to loan those out and work with local agencies that want to use those um, to, to get those counts. That is one thing that Campo um, did, and I, I think several other MPOs are doing that, is essentially the MPO in the region purchased several of these automated counters and then they have those available for the different cities within that region if they want to borrow them. Uh, for say short-term counts on different locations within their city and then they essentially the MPO will sort of pull that data um, from the different member agencies okay. talk a little bit about the trip purpose and uh, the comparisons for pedestrian and, and bike surveys where you can uh, use these methods to get the counts and it's got very good parallels vehicle collection, but we have a very different situation relative to trip purposes, which I assume uh, creates some challenges in person-to-person uh, -person type surveys. Right. So <clears throat> that's, that's, so one of our underlying philosophies that we've used in the traffic monitoring as well as some of the travel survey work is we try and use the basic principles of either traffic monitoring, um, where they're applicable, but, but there's certain things that just don't apply as easily and we need to adapt those for biking and walking. And so for example, the trip purpose, um, some, some bicycling and walking trips are discretionary and depending on the weather that day, depending on a number of different factors, those trips may not occur. Um, and there's, uh, so that's something that we certainly need to consider. Um, one of the other things that I talked about is the variability, okay, and so um, whenever we have such low, when, in, in some cases whenever you have lower volumes and whenever there's more of a tendency for discretionary trips, um, it's just it's more difficult to collect uh, to, uh, statistically valid data. So certainly um, trip purpose comes into play. Um, one of the things that I've heard in different regions, and I'm not sure what, what the thinking is here, um, but I've heard this notion that if it's, a, if it's a recreational trip, then we're not really interested in it. I don't know, is that, is that mentioned a lot here? In, in other words, if, you know, if someone's cycling on, on the bayou, we, we don't really, so um, I, I think that would be okay if we didn't count the people that were driving to gyms on the road, but I, I, I argue that we want to count everybody that's out there 
if it's not for transportation, um, there's, there's other agencies that are interested in it for public health. And in fact, there's, um, there's a couple of DOTs. I know one in particular, Colorado DOT, got some grant funding. And Terry, this is where you know, maybe we need to work together. Uh, Colorado DOT got funding from the, I can't remember if it was a state agency of public health or a regional agency of public health. They essentially got a grant through their public health department to install some of this permanent counter equipment because public health, I mean, physical activity, public health, um, that's, that's a big deal. Public health costs are a big deal these days. I probably diverged a little bit from the trip purpose, but. but uh, to follow up on that, um, I was gonna ask you, since you said you're a data wonk, is there any data yet that puts a dollar value on the health benefits of bicycling and walking. And it seems to me that since at least here, counties typically yeah. are the ones who are funding the pedestrian bicycle facilities yeah. that are off road, and they're also the ones who are funding the county mm -hmm. hospitals, that that yeah. might be a good uh, language that they would be interested in speaking. Yeah, I think so. So there are, there are a couple of things that, I, that, that come to mind. Um, there's, there are, there's one in particular, and I'm not sure that it's the, I mean, it, it comes from an advocacy group, and so people are always going to question advocacy, but there's probably some out there on the economic impacts that come from more of an academic institution. But there's Bikes Belong, I don't know if you've ever heard of that, it's a national advocacy group um, in arguing for sustained or increased funding for bicycling and walking. They look at the public health. Now, I, I know that they, they cite a number of sources that back up their economic costs. Um, give me your card. And I, I know I, I have several people have asked me that same question before, and it seems like I did a quick Google search and found several different things. But I, I know there's something out there. What about inclusive counters? I mean, if we could put inductive loop counters that could in our roadway system that could not only count cars but also detect bicyclists. Yeah, that that would be really good if we could if if it if we could get it to work. But one of the issues is that to optimize counting equipment for cars and trucks, it almost precludes counting accurately for cyclists and pedestrians. At least I haven't seen anything, and a lot of the, the newer, more innovative equipment really doesn't have that combined sort of approach. Um, for example, inductance loops on uh, a trail system, for example, to be able to pick up the smaller amount of metal in a bicycle, you, have to, you essentially have to crank up the sensitivity of the loop detectors, or you have to use a different configuration. That, different configuration or that different sensitivity setting would, would probably most likely overcount on cars and trucks or wasn't, wouldn't count as accurately. Um, one of the things that we are going to try and do here in Houston, and I know this is something that we haven't really talked about a whole lot yet, but the city of Houston has a regular traffic counting program where they're using pneumatic tubes and they're using a certain brand of uh, a, a data collector that goes around with those tubes. and so. Um, we're talking about essentially using the same thing for portable bike counts. So you're not buying additional equipment. You're just using the, the same type of data collection equipment, but maybe you have different, a different configuration um, for bikes. But that, I think that notion is right on. If we can find that where there is some synergy between different, different modes of data collection, it's just it's difficult to do that. I guess what I was thinking is generally the bicyclist is in the outside, outermost lane of the roadway or in the center lane turning left. And that if there were separate loops, one that would detect the motor vehicle and one that would detect the bicyclist. Yeah, that, 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 so that is another possibility. Um, actually, I, I hadn't thought about it, and I don't know if any of the, is the city of Houston, does the city of Houston have any bike detectors on any of the streets for presence detection? Uh, we do, we have loop detectors. We started with loop detectors for intersections, especially like left turn, actuation. Uh, had gone to the, the 
more of a the uh, pole mounted recognition yeah. software. Now we're actually kind of going back towards loops because we found them more effective. Yeah. Plus, you know, those hurricanes we get on occasion really yeah. mess up our equipment. Um, yeah, we're currently using two different types of ATRs for counts, and we have found through trial and error that one of them is better for picking up bicyclists versus the other. And that's why we just yeah. kind of keep moving along, trying to go in the right direction. Yeah. With those but T Terry, your point's well taken. We're actually we're working with um, Phoenix MPO on something similar to this, and there are several cities, I think Glendale and Mesa, um, that have installed bicycle detection. It's not, we don't know for sure, but that's one of the things that we're going to be looking into is whether we can get counts from that bicycle detection or not. So that's, we'll make sure we check into that. If we don't have any more questions, we'll go ahead and end today's session. Um, reminder, please join us on January 23rd for our next Brown Bag meeting. And in the meantime, please join me in thanking Sean for taking the trip down here today.